The Division is back, with a stronger campaign than the first game and a change in scenery from New York to Washington, D.C. It's not a massive reimagining of everything that made The Division good, and with two more years of technology to work with, it's no surprise that The Division 2 will need some series hardware if you want to run at high resolutions, high frame rates, and maximum quality. The good news is that you don't actually need a supercomputer to get the game running acceptably. Budget class graphics cards might need a combination of low and medium settings to break 60 FPS at 1080p, but it's possible to run the game even on integrated graphics. And high end graphics cards can push over 100 FPS at 1440p Ultra, though 4K Ultra is still a bit of a stretch. One note before going any further is that The Division 2 is an AMD promoted game with Ryzen and Radeon branding. With support for DirectX 12, AMD GPUs already get a bit of a performance boost relative to Nvidia, and AMD is more likely to have had input on game optimizations and such. I'd also skip the DX12 mode if you have a graphics card with less than 4GB of VRAM, or a 900 series or older Nvidia card, as DirectX 11 will generally perform a bit better. That's what I've done with these benchmarks, so let's get to it. The Division 2 has a ton of graphics settings you can tweak. 25 of them to be precise, not counting things like resolution, rendering API, and other features. However, the visual and performance impact on many of the settings is slight at best. Switching 14 of the settings from their Ultra preset to the minimum option only improved performance by about 4%. We cover the full suite in our article on PCGamer.com, but volumetric fog and object detail have the largest effect on frame rate, though you probably don't want to drop object quality too much as it can cause a lot of pop in. You may also want to tweak shadow quality, spot shadows, spot shadow resolution, anisotropic filtering, ambient occlusion, extra streaming distance, and water quality, as each of those can improve performance by anywhere from 5 to 10%. MSI has provided all the graphics hardware for testing the Division 2, including the latest GeForce GTX and RTX cards. All of the GPUs I'm using for testing come with modest factory overclocks, which in most cases will improve performance by around 5% over reference models. My primary testbed uses the MSI Z390 MEG godlike motherboard with an overclocked Core i7-8700K processor running at 5GHz and 16GB of DDR4-3200 CL14 memory from G-Skill. For AMD CPUs, I tested with the MSI X470 Gaming M7 AC motherboard for the 2700X and 2600X, while the Ryzen 5 2400G is tested in an MSI B350i Pro AC. All AMD CPUs also use DDR4 3200CL14 memory, and I run the game from an SSD on all test systems. The first Division game had good DirectX 12 support, and that's carried over to the sequel. For all the current generation mid-range and above GPUs, DX12 matches or beats the DX11 performance. There are exceptions, particularly on older GPUs, but outside of the GTX 970, 1050, and 1063 GB, all of the results I'm presenting here are using DirectX 12. Starting at minimum quality and 720p running on Intel's UHD Graphics 630 and AMD's Vega 11 graphics, Intel mostly hits a playable 30fps but with dips sometimes well below that depending on what's going on around you in the game. AMD's integrated graphics are about 25 times faster, averaging nearly 80fps, though again with periodic dips below 60fps. Given you can mostly run The Division 2 on Intel's current GPU, just about any discrete graphics card made in the past 5 years should suffice as well. Jumping to 1080p medium for the next level of testing, real-time frame rate overlays show Nvidia's new GTX 1650 and 1660 Ti going up against AMD's RX 570 4GB and the RX 590. The 1650 ends up being far slower than the other cards, which illustrates the problem with budget graphics cards. Games like this cost $60, and for the price of one game, you can boost performance by 50% or more. Or you could just buy AMD's RX 570, which continues to sell at extremely aggressive prices. The 1660 Ti, meanwhile, edges out the RX 590, though at a higher price. But all four GPUs will easily handle 1080p medium. What about the rest of the cards? Everything from the GTX 970 and above will average 60 FPS or more, with the GTX 1060 and up keeping minimums above that mark as well. Or if you have a 144Hz display, the RTX 2060 and above will generally max out your refresh rate with vSeq enabled. Keeping minimums above that is a bit more difficult, and all of the GPUs have occasional dips below that mark, 
which is why a G-Sync or FreeSync monitor is still the ultimate gaming experience. The jump from medium to ultra quality at 1080p drops performance by almost half on the slower GPUs, while the higher performance cards still do fine. The RX 580 and GTX 1660 are basically tied with Nvidia's card holding just a slight lead and both squeak past the 60fps mark. Vega 56 and RTX 2060 are also running neck and neck, with the AMD card delivering slightly better minimum FPS. When I mention that a game promoted by AMD may favor AMD GPUs, this is exactly what I'm referring to. In a larger test suite of 14 games, the 2060 is about 10% faster on average than the Vega 56, and the GTX 1660 leads the RX 580 by nearly 15%. Looking at the full suite of GPUs, while the RX 580 is the minimum card to average 60 FPS, you'll need at least a GTX 1070 to keep minimums above that mark. And for 144Hz high refresh rate displays, only an RTX 2080 Ti or the ludicrously expensive Titan RTX will break that mark. Again, G-Sync and FreeSync are a great addition if you want to increase the responsiveness of games and avoid tearing and stuttering. 1440p Ultra is the domain of high-end and enthusiast graphics cards, though you can easily run 1440p with lower settings and still hit good frame rates. AMD's top-tier Radeon 7 can't quite keep up with the RTX 2080 at the true enthusiast segment, and the RTX 2070 also beats the Vega 64 at a slightly less extreme price point. The Vega 64 mostly stays above 60fps with occasional dips, and the 2070 ends up about 10-15% faster. Radeon 7 and RTX 2080 meanwhile average about 90fps, and minimums are solidly above 60fps as well. Out of the 25 tested graphics cards, 11 still managed to average 60 FPS. The Vega 56 is the last card to do so. Dropping the quality a notch to the high preset can boost performance about 30%, and the medium preset can boost performance by about 75%, so 1440p is certainly within reach of most GPUs if you're willing to tune your settings. But for ultra quality, only the Radeon 7 and above can keep minimums above 60 FPS, and not even a Titan RTX can hit 144 FPS. And that brings us to 4K Ultra, which again proves just how difficult it can be to try and push over 8 million pixels per frame from your GPU to the screen. The 2080 Ti does get there, with a few dips and stumbles along the way, but the RTX 2080 and Radeon 7 can only manage 45 to 50 frames per second. The Vega 64, meanwhile, plugs along at just above 30 FPS. And that's why 1440p 144Hz and 3440 x 1440 ultra wide monitors continue to be our top recommendation for gaming displays. You can, of course, drop the quality down to high or medium and get a substantial boost in performance. 4K medium at 60 FPS is achievable on the RTX 2070 and above, for example. Or if you don't mind the severe object pop in, 4K using the low preset roughly triples the frame rates shown here. That would allow even the 1060 and 580 to mostly hit 60 FPS. But for most merely mortal gaming PCs, native 4K gaming probably isn't in the cards right now. What about CPU performance? I'm using the RTX 2080 to mostly eliminate GPU bottlenecks at lower resolutions and settings and allow the CPUs to strut their stuff. At 1080p medium, there's a substantial gap between the budget-friendly i3-8100 and Ryzen 2400G and the substantially more expensive 2700X and i7-8700K. And despite the AMD Ryzen branding, Intel's CPUs still easily win in outright performance. The i9-9900K, for example, is about 20% faster than the 2700X. Push the quality up to 1080p Ultra and things get far closer, however. The Core i5-8400 still ties the two AMD Ryzen processors, but the 9900K isn't quite 10% faster than the mid-range GPUs. Less demanding areas in the game can still break 150fps, while more demanding scenes can dip closer to 60fps on the mid-range parts. Quickly running through all the CPUs at our four test settings, the Division 2 definitely likes having more than four CPU cores available. Even with slower cores, the Ryzen 2400G beats the i3-8100 at 1080p, thanks to having SMT and double the threads. But there's a big jump from the 2400G to the 2600X, or the i3-8100 to the i5-8400. And that jump is mostly thanks to cores and threads, not clock speed. 
By 1440p, it's basically a six-way tie among the mid-range and high-end CPUs, and at 4K Ultra, your CPU is mostly a non-factor. Not that anyone should be thinking about running an RTX 2080 with an i3-8100, though I should note that in other testing I've done, Intel's 4th Gen Haswell 4770K is about the same level of performance as the Core i3-8100. So if you're still hanging on to a CPU from 5 or 6 years ago and thinking about running a high-end graphics card, now is the time to upgrade. Wrapping up our testing, we have three RTX laptops from MSI. The GL63 is equipped with a 4-core 8-thread Core i5-8300H and an RTX 2060 with a 120Hz 1080p display. The GS75 and GE75 both use the 6-core 12-thread Core i7-8750H and 144Hz 1080p displays, but the GS75 uses a Max-Q2070 while the GE75 gets a higher performance non-Max-Q Mobile 2080. Clock speed on the CPUs is similar, 4.0 to 4.1 GHz boost, which limits frame rates at 1080p medium. Even at 1080p Ultra, the mobile CPUs appear to hold back performance a bit, though looking at the GE75, it's probably just the lower power and slower clocked graphics chips that make the biggest difference. The RTX 2060 and 2070 Max-Q continue to offer nearly the same level of performance, and given the pricing difference, we'd suggest sticking to the nominally slower 2060 card. Average frame rates are above 60 FPS for both 1080p medium and ultra, but minimum FPS drops below 60 on the two slower laptops. With several months of patches and updates already in the bag, The Division 2 continues to be a popular game. So far, performance hasn't changed much since the initial launch, but stability has improved for those who were experiencing crashes before. Recent NVIDIA drivers in particular have specifically targeted DX12 crashes that were occurring for some users. The Division 2 is also an impressive looking game, bringing the post-disaster world of Washington DC to life, particularly at higher quality settings. But as always, there's a balancing act between image fidelity and performance, and modest PCs and laptops will definitely want to tune some of the settings for an ideal experience. High-end PCs can easily run at 1440p or even 4K and get decent frame rates, particularly with the high and medium presets, while 1080p should be within reach of just about any PC with a dedicated graphics card made in the past several years. As always, thanks to MSI for providing the hardware and sponsorship for these performance analysis articles. We have many more planned for the coming months, including Wolfenstein Youngblood, Control, and a game you may have heard about recently called Borderlands 3. Like and subscribe, and let us know in the comments what other games and tests you want us to run for future videos. Thanks for watching.